Broadcasting through Ancient Greece as an Amazon Associate member. As an Amazon Associate, I earn from qualifying purchases. What this has allowed me to do is recommend books to you guys that are relevant to the episode that I am presenting. The books I'll be recommending I have read myself and made use of during the writing of the series. If you are interested in purchasing what I have recommended, using the link for the book on the episode page of my website will help support the series with providing me a small commission. For this episode I'm going to recommend The Tyrants of Syracuse, Volume 1 by Ian Champion. This book I have found to be a very helpful and accessible book to the early period of the Greeks' activities on Sicily. It has also provided me some interesting insights and theories worth following. If you head to the episode page for the First Sicilian War on the Casting Through Ancient Greece website, you can find the link for The Tyrants of Syracuse, Volume 1 by Ian Champion. Additionally, if you would like to become a member of Audible, the largest collection of audiobooks on the internet, you can click on the Audible banner on the Casting Through Ancient Greece website to gain a 30-day trial membership where you'll also find a number of the books I'll be recommending. They say that on the very same day that the Hellenes won their victory over the Persians at Salamis, Galon and Theron won their battle against Hamilcar the Carthaginian. When battle was joined and he was defeated, he vanished from sight and, Although Galon searched for him everywhere, he was never seen again anywhere in this world, living or dead. Herodotus Hello, I'm Mark Selleck and welcome back to Casting Through Ancient Greece, Episode 40, Sicily, The First Sicilian War. We are now back with Part 3 of our look at the island of Sicily in the context of the Greek world. So far we have covered the early prehistory of the island before any Greek settlers had arrived. This period still remains somewhat mysterious when it comes to the origins of the many indigenous peoples, with much debate still taking place. With time passing through the Bronze, Dark and Archaic Ages, we are then able to see some connections to the Greek world. The Mycenaean Greeks of the Bronze Age seeming to have been actively trading with the island. Though with the collapse of the Bronze Age, the Mediterranean descended into the Dark Age, where trade and settlements went into a regressive state. The rebirth of the Archaic Age in Greece would see many of the Greek settlements faced with the problems of overpopulation. To help this issue, expeditions would be sent out from these cities to found new colonies, with the island of Sicily being a focus of the first wave of migrations. This would see immediate stress relieved from the mother city, with the departure of a percentage of their population, while the creation of new trade markets would help over the coming years. We then saw, as these first Greek colonies were established, that they were done so on an island that was not uninhabited. The Greeks recognised three distinct indigenous cultures while the Phoenicians, originating from the Levant, had also begun setting up trade networks throughout the area. All these groups would for the most part, in the early stages, remain on peaceful terms and even actively engage in trade with one another. Though as more colonies would be established, in and around Sicily, competition around the trade and the routes would start to strain relations. Conflict would start to develop in the region and then on Sicily itself, with the city of Carthage, on the coast of Tunisia, also becoming involved. This period also sees the rise of tyrants in various cities on Sicily, with them following in the footsteps of many of their mother cities. As the 6th century was coming to a close, the Greek expansion had continued, while Carthage had secured much of its trade network throughout the area, bringing many Phoenician colonies on Africa, Iberia and Sicily into an alliance that it would control. This episode will be turning to events on Sicily at the close of the 6th century and heading into the period that the Greek and Persian Wars was developing and taking place over on the Greek mainland in Aegean. This will see us focusing on the rise of yet more tyrants, though with their ambitions now focused on the other Greek cities, with them attempting to bring large parts of the island under their control, if not all of it. We will also see the already important and wealthy city of Syracuse take centre stage becoming the centre of power for the Greeks on the island. Finally, we will also see a renewed effort by Carthage to campaign on Sicily against the Greeks, beginning what's known as the First Sicilian War culminating in the Battle of Hymera. We ended last episode with Carthage having secured its trade interests in the region in the face of further Greek expansion. Now we are going to zoom in on the Greeks back in Sicily and the road towards one of the most influential tyrannies to develop. Here we will head to the city of Gila, on the southern coast, for which we will see the path develop of the tyrant Gilon. Tyrannies were still a very viable option in the political landscape of the late 6th century and early 5th centuries in Sicily. This period also saw tyrannies on the Greek mainland, 
with Athens only having overthrown their tyranny of Hippias in 510 BC, and the threat of tyranny only fading away with the rise to power of Clisisthenes in 507 BC. In the city of Gila, a man by the name of Cleander had rose to power as tyrant in 505 BC, overthrowing the oligarchic government of the city, presumably controlled by the aristocratic class. We don't hear much about his time as tyrant at all, but we hear from Herodotus that he ruled for some seven years, where he was then murdered in 498 BC by Sibylos of Gila. It would be reasonable to assume here that Sibylos was from the landowning aristocratic class, and in these early stages of tyranny, they were attempting to gain power back. Though power and Gila would continue under another tyrant, Cleander's brother Hippocrates. It appears these political troubles continued as Hippocrates took power, as his brother would be assassinated. I want to be clear here that these political skirmishes are an educated guess, as we get no information on what was taking place during this time. Though, eventually Hippocrates secured himself as tyrant after gaining support of a popular noble named Gilon. So in turn, Gilon's supporters were now backing Hippocrates. Herodotus tells us that Gilon was made commander of the whole cavalry because of his valour and competence, but it was probably a good judgement that saw Hippocrates elevate Gilon to this position, since the support that Gilon brought with him cemented Hippocrates' position as tyrant. We once again don't receive many details of Hippocrates' rule, but from what we do here, it appears his time as tyrant was dominated by military campaigning. As we saw before with Phalaris, he directed his campaigns at the Sickles, this looking to expand the territory around Gila. The city's control did not extend that far, with the Sickles controlling the wooded and mountainous regions around with their fortified settlements. It is thought that the Sickles fought as lightly armed skirmishes, which would see them excel in this sort of terrain. The Greeks, on the other hand, who fought as heavily armoured hoplites in phalanx formation, rather than open flat ground. This may explain why Gila's territory had not expanded very far, though Hippocrates now sought to extend Gila's territory. He did this by recruiting the Sickles as mercenaries in his army. We hear through Polyenus, who wrote Stratagems of War in the 2nd century AD, how he was able to entice them into his service. He always gave them the largest portion in the distribution of booty. He gave them increased pay, he complimented them on being the best troops in his army, and he tried by every means to entice as many of them as possible into his service. The honours, the advantages, and the reputation which they acquired under Hippocrates induced them to leave their city in great numbers, in order to enlist in his army. Once Hippocrates was able to defeat the various sickle tribes around Gila, he was able to secure the western and northern routes from the city. This now allowed him to shift focus and begin campaigning further afield. This time though, we would see a somewhat relatively new development occur when it came to the conflicts on the island. For the most part in the past, the Greeks had focused on the local Sicilian tribes or the Phoenician cities, but now Hippocrates would direct the next part of his campaign against the other Greek cities of Sicily. His campaign would be directed at the entire eastern coast of the island, where he would capture the cities of Calipolis, Naxos, Zankel, and Leotini, as well as a number of sickle settlements. The capture of Zankel in the northeast would be somewhat connected with the events over in the Aegean. The Battle of Lade had just been fought in 494 BC, seeing the effective end to the Ionian Revolt. The majority of the Samians during the battle had fled without fighting, apparently an agreement arranged beforehand. Though many of the Samians back on Samos, learning of the deal, decided to leave the island and start their own colony, rather than becoming slaves to a Persian-backed tyrant. It was during the expedition to found this new colony that an opportunity presented itself. It appears that Zankel was originally in an alliance with Hippocrates, and may have been taking part in the campaign. We hear that they were off besieging sickle settlements when the city of Region, on the Italian southern coast, and hostile to Zankel, were able to get in communication with the Samians, and convince them to make for Zankel, and make it their own, since all the fighting men were away. The men of Zankel learned of their city being occupied by the Samians, and march home to defend the city. They had also sent help to Hippocrates, but once arriving he placed the tyrant of Zankel in change for allowing his city to be captured so easily. A new opportunity now presented itself to Hippocrates, and he decided to take it. He betrayed the people of Zankel, and came to an agreement with the Samians. We hear he took possession of all the movable property in the city, and enslaved the Zankleans. It is probably safe to assume here that Zankel, although left to the Samians, was probably under Hippocrates' influence also. 
We hear that of all of the cities that Hippocrates had besieged, Syracuse, the most powerful of them all, was the only one not to fall to him. Before marching on Syracuse, Hippocrates fought the Syracusan army at the river Helorus, where he was able to defeat them. We have no other details of the battle other than that he was able to capture a number of the Syracusans as prisoners of war. It is thought that the battle occurred somewhere around 492 or 491, just before the first Persian invasion of Greece. This then opened the road to Syracuse. Hippocrates and his army made camp some five kilometres south of the city, where the Temple of Zeus stood. We hear through Diodorus that he attempted to appeal to the people of Syracuse by leaving in place the dedications within the temple, as to show his devotion to the divine. He had also presented the priests of the temple as to spoilers, as they were in the process of removing everything of value as Hippocrates' army had been approaching. His tact at winning over the people and taking the city from within would not be successful, however. Without a powerful navy, an ability to lay siege to such a powerfully fortified city, he was unable to take it by force. In the end, the issue around Syracuse would be resolved by mediation, overseen by Corinth and Corsaira. Peace would be made, though Hippocrates would gain the city of Camarina, east of Gala, once controlled by Syracuse, by trading the Syracusan prisoners he had captured. Here he would make a base for part of his mercenary force. It must be noted that it is hard to place the unfolding of events of Hippocrates' campaign, but we do hear, seven years after becoming tyrant, he would be killed when fighting the Sickles, presumably attempting to extend the influence around the Greek cities already captured. Herodotus has him falling at the Sickles city of Hybla, inland from the mid-eastern coast. It can be seen that Hippocrates had in his campaigns attempted to create a unified Greek empire on Sicily, under his rule of course. Though this vision of his would fall short and it would be others that would now attempt to see through this project. Hippocrates' death had once again seen the opposition to tyranny in Gila rise up. But the momentum of Hippocrates' rule would see that conditions were still ripe for a new tyrant to take control and squash any opposition. Herodotus tells us that during the seven years of campaigning, Galon, Hippocrates' cavalry commander, had emerged as the most brilliant of military men. It would be he who would defeat the uprising in the name of Hippocrates' sons, but once defeated, he would turn against them and take power for himself. Galon, according to Herodotus, was from the aristocratic part of Gila's population with his ancestors having been amongst the original colonizers back in 698 BC. We also hear that his descendants would fulfill the role of priests of the goddesses of the underworld, Demeter and Persephone, which would continue on through the family line. We have seen opportunities presenting themselves through this period, and now it would be Gilon's turn to capitalize. Once the uprising against Hippocrates' sons was defeated, he seems to have had no trouble in establishing himself as tyrant. As we saw, he was a popular noble, with Hippocrates having used his support to help establish his tyrannies seven years earlier. We also see that after the years of campaigning, Gilon built up a reputation as a great military commander, with probably having the respect of the citizens of Gila he had led, as well as the mercenaries that had been recruited and fought under him. It would seem once he usurped Hippocrates' sons, he would have a strong popular following, along with a strong military backing to cement his position. Another opportunity would present itself to Gilon, a few years after coming to power, in an area that Hippocrates had failed in. This was to do with the city of Syracuse, which seems to have had problems with civil strife. Hippocrates seems to have been very unlucky here, as it appears the conditions were ripe for the approach that he had taken in attempting to take the city. But it would appear, the ruling class were able to maintain some sort of order long enough for mediation to be reached. Now though, it would appear that things in Syracuse had reached a tipping point. The landowners, which would have included the aristocracy, were expelled from the city and went into exile. Gelon, instead of appealing to the lower classes and slaves of Syracuse, turned to helping the exiles. Though, of course, this wasn't from the kindness of his heart. He was looking to advance his own aims, and his help would come at a cost. He made an alliance with the exiled aristocrats, and then marched with them and his army to Syracuse. With the approach of the army, the newly formed regime descended into anarchy, and Syracuse was surrendered to Gelon. Syracuse was the largest and richest Greek city on Sicily, so Gilon now established himself here. He would also relocate the mercenary force that had been settled in Camarina by Hippocrates and would make them citizens, further securing their loyalty. Although he had left Gila, it remained under his control with his brother being installed as governor there. 
The taking of Syracuse would elevate the power of Gelon considerably, as not only did he now have the wealthy city under his control, but the harbour that Syracuse possessed would allow him to field a considerable navy. Not only would he have a strong military presence on land, but he could also exert control into the sea. He now took measures to consolidate his position, where he oversaw the further growth and expansion of the city. It seems he had a program of forced relocation in place, though how forced this was would have depended on the populations that came to Syracuse. We hear that over half the population of Gila was settled in Syracuse and made citizens, while the populations of Megarohublia and Leotini suffered different fates depending on their class, after having surrendered to him. The aristocratic class he brought to Syracuse and made citizens, while the lower classes were also relocated but were sold into slavery. It seems Gilon was attempting to stack the odds in favour of the aristocratic class in Syracuse, well those at least in favour of his tyranny. It's quite possible that Syracuse may have had one of the highest ratios of wealthy to poor in the Greek world, though the poor would have still outnumbered the rich. We get the impression through Herodotus that Gilon found the lower classes very distasteful, where he says in regards to Gilon's relocation policy, he was motivated by the belief that living with the people was most difficult and unpleasant. Along with Gilon's consolidations, he would have been actively increasing the size of his forces as he was planning a campaign against the Carthaginians. We find during this period, as preparations were being made, political developments around the island were also taking place with a coming campaign in mind. Gilon had secured an alliance with another tyrant, Theron, who had risen to power in Acragus, around the same time Gilon was taking control in Gila. Theron appears to have taken control in Acragus in a very similar fashion to Phalaris that we saw last episode. Between the two, most of the Greek cities on Sicily would fall under their control to some degree for the coming conflict, though there were a few Greek cities that would not ally themselves with Gilon and Theron, and perhaps for protection against any retribution from these tyrants, they sought an alliance with the Carthaginians. Hymera and Salinas were geographically some distance from Gilon's influence and close to the Carthaginian controlled west coast, while Messena, formerly Zankul in the northeast, was controlled by Regian. Regian had captured the city, placed it under their control, and renamed it. After Hippocrates' campaign, Messena sought to protect its independence from Gelon, with an alliance with Hymera and Carthage. We also find the notion that Gelon's coming campaign was being presented as a sort of holy war between Greeks and the Barbarian. It appears that he had sent for an alliance with the Greeks on mainland Greece, though it would not be formed. We find Herodotus reporting Gelon's reference to this when rebuking the Greeks when they came seeking his aid in their war with Xerxes. Men of Hellas, you have been so bold to come here and present your self-seeking request, summoning me to become your ally against the Barbarian. A while ago, however, when I was waging war with the Carthaginians, I asked you then to join me in attacking our Barbarian army. I urged you to exact vengeance from the Agestians for the murder of Dorius, son of Anaxandritus, and I offered to join in you defending the freedom of the trading posts which have provided you with great profits and benefits. But then you refused to come for my sake to help against the Barbarian, or to participate in avenging the murder of Dorius. It would appear that the campaigning had been taking place against the Phoenician and Carthaginian ports and trading settlements over this period, but we get no real details or time frame to put them into. Though we do get in the sources a point in Gilon and Theron's campaigning that would see Carthage now actively prepare for war and their own campaign against the Greeks in Sicily. At some stage during the campaigning, Theron had attacked the city of Hymera. This is not the larger battle of Hymera that we'll be focusing on, but would help lead to it being fought. Hymera was also controlled by a tyrant at this stage, named Terilo, though not much is known about his rise to power. Once again, we would see a very similar situation occur with Phalaris's campaigning beginning in Acragus. Theron, during the campaign, would arrive outside Hymera and would end up taking control of the city, ousting Tyrolo from power. It seems the earlier efforts by Gelon and Theron around attacking Phoenician settlements would have no doubt come to the Carthaginians' attention, but it doesn't seem to have solicited a dramatic response. Though, with the taking of Hymera, who had put themselves in a power block allied to Carthage, the power dynamics and threat to Carthaginian interests in Sicily were now being tested. 
Hymera was effectively bordering territory controlled by the Phoenicians, and by extension, Carthage. Losing the city would also see Messina isolated up on the northeast. If measures were not taken, Carthage could well lose control and influence that had built up on the island over the generations. It's at this point that we now begin to hear of the preparations Carthage was making for its campaign in Sicily. Though before we get into the war that was about to unfold, I want to take a slight sidestep and focus on the connection we see appear in the sources between events in the Aegean and what was unfolding in Sicily, which I have briefly alluded to. Since 1998, Stamps.com has been an indispensable tool for nearly 1 million businesses. Stamps.com brings the services of the US Postal Service and UPS shipping right to your computer. Whether you're an office sending invoices, a side hustle on Etsy shop, or a full-blown warehouse shipping out orders, Stamps.com will make your life easier. All you need is a computer and a standard printer. No special supplies or equipment. Within minutes, you're up and running, printing official postage for any letter, any package, anywhere you want to send. And you'll get exclusive discounts on postage and shipping from USPS and UPS. Once your mail is ready, just schedule a pickup or drop it off. No traffic, no lines. Cut the confusion out of shipping with Stamp.com's new Rate Advisor tool. You can compare shipping rates and timelines to easily find the best option. Save time and money with Stamps.com. There's no risk, and with my promo code POD, P-O-D, you get a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to Stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in POD, P-O-D. That's Stamps.com, promo code POD. Stamps.com, never go to the post office again. Have you been enjoying the series and want to show your support in some way? You can visit www.castingthroughancientgreece.com and click on the support the series button. Here you will find many ways you can help the series grow, from subscribing, getting involved in social media, and leaving reviews where you listen to your podcasts. Other options also include assisting with my Amazon wishlist for resources, and supporting the series on Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee. The support I have been receiving so far has been fantastic. So a big thank you to everyone who has been helping me grow the series. It was around this point, before Carthage's campaign, but with some idea of what was developing, that a delegation from the newly formed Hellenic League arrived in Syracuse to seek an audience with Galon. We have already pointed out that it seems Galon had sought aid himself from the Greeks a few years earlier when beginning his campaign against the so-called barbarians. His call for help went unanswered, but now the Greeks from the mainland were seeking all the help that they could get, now being aware of the invasion Xerxes was planning against Greece. Herodotus reports the envoys presenting to Galon. The Lacedaemonians and their allies have sent us to recruit you to our side against the barbarian. For surely you have heard of this invasion of Hellas, how the Persian has bridged the Hellespont and is bringing the whole army of the east out of Asia to lead a campaign against Hellas. His pretext is that he is marching against Athens, but he actually plans to subjugate all of Hellas to himself. You yourself have attained great power and your share of Hellas is hardly insignificant, since you rule over Sicily. So help us defend the freedom of Hellas, and join us in keeping it free. With all the men of Hellas joined together, a great force will be assembled, and with it we can match the invaders in battle. If, however, some of us turn traitor and others refuse to help defend Hellas, the health of Hellas will be much diminished, and therein lies the danger that all of Hellas will fall. For you should not expect that if the Persian defeats us in battle, and subjects us to his rule, that he will not then march against you. After hearing this plea, Galon then proceeded to rebuke the delegation for the Greeks' failure to enter his call for aid a couple of years earlier, which we quoted a little earlier. Though we hear through Herodotus that he offered to help the Greek cause against the Persians, offering 200 triremes, 20,000 hoplites, 2,000 cavalry, and 4,000 light troops, as well as feeding all the forces for the duration of the war. His one stipulation, though, was to be in command of the entire Greek force. This condition was unacceptable to the League, and Galon attempted to compromise by asking for command of either the land or the sea forces. But again, this was an unacceptable condition. The League not willing to have a tyrant control their entire allied force from Greece. They would have been well aware of his campaigns in Sicily against other Greek cities. With no agreement being reached between the two parties, Galon left them with these words. 
My friend, Galon replied, it looks as if you have the commanders, but will not have any men for them to command. Since, therefore, you claim everything and yield nothing, you had better go as quickly as you can and tell Greece that the spring of the year is lost to her. To close out this account of this meeting, Herodotus then tells us that Galon took measures to hedge his bets, once news of Xerxes' invasion had crossed the Hellespont. He thought it unlikely that the Greeks would resist such a large force, so he sent a representative to Delphi with a large sum of money and instructions to offer earth and water to Xerxes, if he prevailed in Greece. If not, the representatives were to return back to Syracuse with the money and offers of submission. The question has to be asked if Galon could have realistically offered this help. This question becomes a more obvious one once we are aware of the Carthaginian invasion a year or so later. So we are using hindsight in trying to address this question. Galon and Theron were conducting operations around this time, but we were not entirely clear on the exact year the campaigns were taking place. So it could be entirely possible that Galon thought that he had men and resources to spare to send to Greece. Also, at this stage, there wasn't any direct threat from Carthaginian invasion, though it seems likely that Theron's capture of Hymera probably took place just before the delegation's arrival, this being the event that would see the Carthaginians prepare for their own campaign. But it is hard for us to tell the timeline of the preparations in relation to the Greeks' plea for assistance. Surely, if Galon had knowledge of a large Carthaginian force being assembled, he would not have seriously offered up these forces. We do find Herodotus suggesting that Galon did not send these forces for this exact reason, and perhaps the offer in the account was a face-saving exercise, with knowledge that the Greeks would not accept his terms of being named commander. Though he does report he heard from a Sicilian source that Galon would have ended up sending a force, even if he didn't receive command. But the knowledge of the coming invasion prevented his doing so. I personally find it hard to believe that he wouldn't have heard whisperings about possible Carthaginian actions against him. But on the face of it, and the very limited information in the sources, it seems plausible he could have offered the help Herodotus reports, providing the timeline supported Galon being unaware of the Carthaginians' preparation early on. With the threat to Carthaginian interests in Sicily at its worst since securing their alliances, Carthage would now put in motion preparations to sail against the island. The size of the force that would be sent was unprecedented, which probably attests to the seriousness of the situation as well as the power the Gelon and Theron alliance held. Leading this force was Hamilcar. He was from the Marganid family or dynasty, the line that came to power after Malchus's downfall. For the forces that he would command, we need to turn to Herodotus and Diodorus, though we need to keep in mind what they report are often thought as an exaggeration. Though seeing what we have through the series so far when it comes to Greek writers describing foreign invasions, this should come as no surprise. Diodorus says that Hamilcar would sail with no less than 300,000 troops, with a navy made up of 200 triremes and 3,000 transport ships, with Herodotus providing the same number of troops. Many modern historians believe that Hamilcar's force would have most likely numbered somewhere around 50,000, with perhaps 500 to 600 transports, a more realistic number. Though the reported size of the fleet of triremes seems believable, since we have seen Galon was able to muster a fleet this size himself. We get a sense of the level of preparations through Herodotus, where he gives us a similar picture to what he describes as Xerxes' preparations against Greece. It would appear the campaign was three years in the making, with Hamilcar assembling troops from many areas that Carthage had spread its influence to. Men from Carthage, Libya, Iberia, Liguria, Helistia, Sardinia and Corsica would all be part of the invasion against Sicily. The campaign would finally begin in 480 BC, the same year Xerxes would unleash his invasion of Greece. This brings us to another question that has been brought up on a number of occasions. Was Xerxes and Hamilcar in communication during the lead-up to the campaigns? This could possibly have seen them occurring as part of a larger strategy, not allowing the Greeks of Sicily or Greece to come to the aid of one another, as Diodorus suggests when speaking of Xerxes. He, being Xerxes, sent an embassy to the Carthaginians to urge them to join him in the undertaking and close an agreement with them, to the effect that he would wage war upon the Greeks who lived in Greece, while the Carthaginians should at the same time gather great armaments and subdue those Greeks who lived in Sicily and Italy. Although we have no sources that can provide any evidence of these communications and agreements being made, it doesn't seem out of the realm of possibility, since this approach would have benefited both Persia and Carthage. 
Also, it seems there would have been a line of communication between the two because of their Phoenician connections. Carthage being of Phoenician origins, while the Phoenician cities in the Levant were integral to the Persian fleet. Let's now turn to the events of the Carthaginians 480 BC campaign of Sicily, or otherwise known as the First Sicilian War. The forces assembled would set out from Carthage to cross the Libyan Sea to make their way for Sicily. During the voyage, they would be struck by a storm that we hear would see Hamilcar lose most of his cavalry and chariots. This storm may not have been the disaster it was made out to be in the ancient sources, as Ian Champion in his book The Tyrants of Syracuse points out. He says that theory suggests that Hamilcar was looking to recruit cavalry from the local allied population. This would reduce the stress on logistics as well as making the journey far less complicated. He also puts forward the suggestion that the storm that the fleet had to contend with may have in fact worked in Carthage's favour, as it saw that Gilon's fleet would not be able to challenge them before making land at Sicily. It would seem that the main initial objective and the reason for the campaign was in fact Hymera, as the sources have pointed out this being supported by the location the Carthaginian fleet put in at. The west coast would have seemed like an obvious choice being closer and having many friendly ports, with Matoya, the largest Phoenician city amongst them, though the fleet would continue to round the west coast and head to the north, where they would finally arrive at Panormus. Once the forces disembarked, they would stay in the region for three days to reorganise and recover from the voyage. Once the ships were repaired and the men rested, Hamilcar would now march towards Hymera, with the fleet shadowing them just off the coast. Once arriving outside the city, Hamilcar would have two camps established, one of his land forces and one for the naval force. Hymera was on high ground, like most important cities in ancient times. It sat on a hill some 100 metres above the surrounding land, so time and organisation would be needed for whatever approach Hamilcar would take. It seems settling in for a siege may have been the intention as we hear of extensive defensive works being constructed around the camps while the transports once unloaded of their supplies were sent back to ports in Sardinia and Lydia to collect more grain and supplies. At some stage after the preparations outside Homera, a force was assembled of the best troops in the army, who then advanced onto the city. It's unclear how big this force was and what the intention was sending them forward, possibly a probe or reconnaissance. Whatever the case, a force went out of the city to challenge them but were defeated, being routed with many of them killed. It is worth pointing out here that it is also thought Theron deployed this force first outside of Hymera, with Hamilcar then responding. Diodorus indicates that this force was made up of the Hymerians, while Theron and his forces were standing by, presumably in the city. Witnessing the Carthaginian victory alarmed Theron, who at once sent word to Gelon back in Syracuse to come to his aid as soon as possible. Gelon, who appears to have had his forces assembled, probably due to the news of the Carthaginians' approach to Sicily, now set off with all haste that it was clear where Hamilcar was focusing his forces. We hear from Diodorus that Gelon marched with a force of around 50,000 troops and a cavalry force of 5,000. The historian in Champion points out that the credibility of these figures could go either way, with some seeing them as plausible due to the previous year's campaigning with the increased numbers of cities that could be called upon. Also, as we have seen, the Sickles were extensively recruited as mercenaries. On the other hand, it is thought Diodorus talked up the numbers to make events on Sicily seem as impressive as what was unfolding in Greece, often pointing to the fact that Epirus, some 200 years later, would only muster 25,000 troops from the same cities. Though, for the most part, it is generally thought that the Greeks and Carthaginians were somewhat on par in numbers once Galon arrived on the scene. The shaky morale of the Greeks in Hymera after the defeat was now restored with the arrival of Gelon and his army. They would set up camp outside of the city and would fortify their position with a palisade and ditch. The force marched by Gelon would catch the Carthaginians by surprise, who we are told were off foraging and in the search of booty in the surrounding regions. Gelon, on his arrival, learned of this and quickly took advantage of their vulnerable position. The cavalry force was sent to target the Carthaginian foragers who had no cavalry protection of their own, since most had been lost at sea on the journey from Libya. The Greek cavalry were very successful in their mission, capturing 10,000 of the enemy, we are told. Their success also contributed to the further bolstering of morale within the army, where Gelon was able to show his superiority over the enemy. With the Greek camp built, the cavalry's success and morale now at its height, 
Gilon began planning on defeating Hamilcar's entire force. His mind turned to the Carthaginian lifeline, the fleet. Attacking the naval camp and setting fire to the fleet would see the Carthaginians in a precarious position, without any lines of communication or means of being resupplied. As luck would have it, an opportunity would arise, giving him the perfect means to support this plan. Hamilcar, seeing his vulnerability in the face of the Greek cavalry, had been sending messages to the city of Salinas, the Greek city in the south allied to Carthage, for them to send a cavalry force to help support his position. Gilon's patrols had intercepted a messenger carrying the plans for the cavalry's arrival at the Carthaginian camp. Gilon now took measures to ensure it would be his cavalry that would appear at the arranged place and time. During the night, the cavalry were sent out to approach the Carthaginian naval camp as morning dawned. The guards took them to be the Selenian cavalry that they were awaiting and admitted them to the camp. This would now see the opening to the Battle of Hymera develop. I just want to point out that the events here around the Battle of Hymera I have put together mostly from Diodorus's account, as he gives us the most detailed account of the battle, where Herodotus just tells us that the battle lasted all day in an even contest until the Greeks got the upper hand. He also reports Hamilcar committed suicide after learning of his army's defeat, this last part being at odds with Diodorus's account. With Gelon's cavalry in the camp, we hear that they made their way straight to where Hamilcar was offering up a sacrifice and slew him. From here, they were able to make their way to the ships and set them alight. Gelon, during the night, had also sent off some scouts to high ground to observe when the cavalry was inside the camp. These scouts now raise a signal back to Gelon, back in the camp where his forces were assembled. The Greek army with Gilon leading it, now set in motion, and marched onto the Carthaginian camp with the land forces. The commanders of the army inside the camp had observed Gilon's activities and led their forces out to meet the advancing Greeks. The sounds of battle were being raised on both sides, and in short order, battle was joined by both as they attempted to outdo one another with their war cries as they closed ranks. Both Diodorus and Horatus indicate the battle that erupted was evenly matched with it swaying back and forth. Though, as the battle raged, news would finally make its way to both the Greek and Carthaginian lines of the death of Hamilcar. This would see a renewed vigour installed into the Greeks, while the morale of the Carthaginians would begin to waver at the death of their commander. Added to this was the sight of the flames that had now engulfed much of the naval camp, destroying the Carthaginian lifeline. This now saw the tipping point in the battle, and the Carthaginian forces broke, with a rout ensuring. As we have seen with a number of battles now, this was the point where we hear of the greatest slaughter taking place. The routed side with no cohesion was completely defenceless and at the mercy of the attackers. In this case, during the rout, there would be no mercy as Gilon had issued orders that no prisoners were to be taken. Those who managed to escape the initial slaughter of the rout were able to form back up on defensible terrain where they now attempted to beat back the advancing victorious Greeks. It appears they were able to hold their position for a time but with no access to drinking water in their new position, exhausted and probably with many wounded, the Carthaginian force surrendered to Gelon. This would bring the Battle of Hymera to a close, where Diodorus tells us news of the disaster only reached Carthage from a handful of survivors. The defeat being so absolute, with just about all who participated either killed or captured. We are told of 20 ships that managed to escape during the battle, though they would encounter a storm trying to return to Libya with only a few men making it back, bringing news of the defeat. Tradition would have it that the victory of Hymera would occur on the same day the pass at Thermopylae was being fought over, according to Diodorus, while Horatus says it took place the same day the Greeks won their victory at Salamis against Xerxes' fleet. Hymera would also see Gelon's reputation and wealth grow even further. A total defeat of the Carthaginians had seen much booty to be collected, with obviously Gelon being able to take and distribute as he saw fit. Also, his use of strategy and his leadership during the battle would see his already great reputation as a general reach new heights. Many of the cities, including Syracuse, who had taken part in the battle on Gelon's side, would raise new temples with the booty that was collected, with us hearing that much of the works would be carried out by the captured Carthaginians, now reduced to slavery. It's also interesting to read from Diodorus, thinking back to the Greeks' plea for help against Xerxes, that Gelon, after a victory over Hamilcar, now began to make preparations to sail for Greece, to bolster their numbers. Though, we hear, just as they were ready to sail, 
some Corinthians arrived at Syracuse to bring news of the Greek victory at Salamis, and part of the Persian army withdrawing from Greece. How accurate this report is is hard to tell. As we discussed before, it was plausible that Galen wanted to aid the Greeks, but aware of the Carthaginian threat did not want to leave. Having now neutralised the threat, he could have been free to send aid. But having said this, we also need to keep in mind Diodorus was a very proud Sicilian Greek, who does like to show that the great deeds of Sicily being on par with that of mainland Greece. Back in Carthage, damage control was underway. The Carthaginians, with such a great proportion of their fighting strength wiped out, feared that the Greeks might cross the sea and make war on Carthage. With this in mind, they arranged for a delegation to be sent to Gilon to negotiate a peace. It appears the terms arranged were very mild, with Gilon receiving a 2,000 talent indemnity for what the war had cost him. Other than that, the geopolitical position of the Greeks and Phoenician cities remained unchanged. With it suggested, Gilon wanted them left alone to provide a threat against rival Greek tyrants in other cities. Gilon would die in 478 BC, with power transferring to his brother, Huron. But Gilon would be remembered by future generations as presiding over a golden age in Sicily. He had seen the already wealthy city of Syracuse rise to new heights of wealth and prosperity. Trade amongst the Greek cities of Sicily would also continue to grow, with power having been consolidated through the past campaigns and now the removal of the Carthaginian threat. The disaster at Hymera would see Carthage turn its attentions to expanding in regions closer to home, and would leave Sicily alone for the most part for the next 70 years. Obviously, the events in Sicily would continue to evolve with new political developments, conflicts and wars. As you can probably guess from the title of this episode, there would be more Sicilian wars to come with this being only the first. But Gilon's death marks a point we left events in the Aegean, with the Greeks' victory over the Persians. This, I think, brings us up to speed with the developments of Sicily and it being connected to the Greek world. Though, as we continue with the series, we will be dropping back in on the island of Sicily to revisit events, as the 5th century would continue. Next up in our look on the Greek periphery, we'll be turning our attention to those wild lands to the north of Greece, inhabited by many different tribal groups. This region will be collectively known as Thrace. Thank you everyone for your continued support, and a big shout out to all those who have found some value in the series, and have been supporting it on Patreon, and other various ways. Your contribution is truly helping me grow the series. I would like to give a personal shout out to some new Patreon members, who have recently signed up to support the series. A huge thank you to James Casimias and Daniel Ross. I really appreciate your support towards the show. If you have also found some value in the show, and wish to support the series, you can head to www.castingthroughancientgreece.com and click on the support the series button, where you can discover many ways to extend your support to helping the series grow. Be sure to stay connected and updated with what's happening in the series, and join me over on Facebook or Instagram at Casting Through Ancient Greece, or on Twitter at Casting Greece. And be sure to subscribe to the series over at the Casting Through Ancient Greece website. I hope you can join me next time for episode 41, The Greek Periphery, Thrace.